Dear students, in the previous two videos I showed you how to calculate the performance limits of an aircraft. These limits provide the combinations of altitude and airspeed at which an aircraft can fly from a performance point of view. So this is what the aircraft is able to do based on the propulsion system characteristics, the aerodynamic performance and the aircraft weight. However, this does not necessarily mean that the aircraft is allowed to fly in all these conditions. There are some other operational factors which also need to be taken into account. Now I will address the operational limits of an aircraft in this video and the next. If these are combined with the performance limits, then we know in what conditions the aircraft can fly and is also allowed to fly. Now there are five limiting factors I would like to address. Maneuver loads, aeroelastic effects, gust loads, Mach number limits and the pressurized cabin. Let's start with the maneuver loads. During any flight, the pilot will intentionally perform maneuvers. Whilst performing a maneuver, the lift will either be larger or smaller than the aircraft weight. Now the ratio of lift divided by weight is what we call the load factor. Whenever n equals 1, such as in cruise flight, the pilot feels the normal gravitational forces. If n is larger than 1, then the aircraft is accelerated perpendicular to the flight path. For the pilot, this feels as if the gravitational force is increased. This is why the load factor is expressed in g-forces. Now, just like on the pilot, the structural loads on the airframe are increased as well. The airframe, of course, has to be designed to be able to cope with all the loads it may encounter during a flight as a result of maneuvering. For this purpose, the flight maneuvering envelope was defined. It is a diagram with load factor on the y-axis and the equivalent airspeed on the x-axis. Different types of aircraft will conduct, conduct different types of maneuvers. For example, military aircraft are used to execute high G maneuvers, whereas commercial aircraft only perform gentle low G maneuvers. Because of this difference, the airworthiness authorities have set different load factor limits for different aircraft categories. Let's take a civil jet aeroplane. This will have a limit positive load factor of 2.5 and a limit negative load factor of minus 1. Commercial aircraft have a design cruise speed, VC, at which they will achieve their best range performance. Now the certification specifications state that the aircraft must be free of vibrations and buffeting up to the design dive speed, VD, which is 25% greater than the design cruise speed. Now the aircraft must not go faster than the speed and thus this gives us a limit on the airspeed. For low airspeeds there is also a limit, stall. Now let's derive what the stall speed limit looks like in the maneuvering envelope. We start off by saying lift is equal to n times the weight, because we're considering a maneuver and load factor was defined as lift divided by weight. Now we all know the equation for lift, which is CL times a half rho V squared S, and this should be equal to N times the weight. So if we single out V in this equation, we obtain the following. V equals to the square root of weight over S times 2 over rho times 1 over CL multiplied with the square root of N. Now, if we're interested in calculating the minimum airspeed, we know we have to fly at the maximum CL. And this will give us the minimum airspeed. Now, what is interesting to see now is that this part of the equation is the minimum airspeed we already knew for cruise flight conditions in which n equals to 1. So what does this tell us? The minimum airspeed is now the minimum airspeed at load factor is 1 multiplied with the square root 
of the load factor. So what does this look like in our diagram where we have load factor on the y-axis and airspeed on the x-axis. If I would make a graph of this equation, so a graph of the minimum airspeed, it looks something like this. And if we take the load factor is one condition, then that will give us our stall speed at steady horizontal flight conditions. Now what you see is that we also have a limit, a stall speed limit, for load factors which are larger than one. And we see that this minimum airspeed, V min, is larger than the minimum airspeed at load factor is one, in case the load factor is larger than one. So what does that mean? In this condition, one is flying at the CL max condition. And if lift equals to weight in the cruise condition, then the aircraft uses all the lift to balance weight with CL max, and it cannot maneuver, make any maneuvers, because there is not the, the aircraft cannot generate more lift. Whereas if the aircraft would be maneuvering, part of the lift is used for maneuvering, so the stall speed limit is a bit higher. So the aircraft must fly a bit faster in order to generate enough lift um, to fly at this condition. Now this diagram also has a negative side. It looks more or less the same. And that may be a little bit of a strange limit, but this means that basically the wing also stalls for negative angle, angles of attack at certain points. And that's basically the same as for the positive limit. Now that concludes the uh, derivation for the stall speed limit in this diagram. So, we have an equation for n as a function of the airspeed. If this is our normal stall speed at n equals 1, then the load factor limit looks like this. So this is an aerodynamic limit. The diagram is almost complete now. The design dive speed, the name already indicates it, is one that typically will only be encountered in a dive. If one conducts a maneuver with a negative g, it means the stick is being pushed forwards and the plane will go in a steeper dive. So the combination of airspeeds beyond the design cruise speed and negative load factors will not be encountered. If the aircraft is in that situation, it will go beyond the design dive speed anyway. And this is why there is one additional limit. From the negative load factor limit at the design cruise speed up to 0g at the design dive speed. Now this completes the maneuver envelope. The aircraft structure must be designed to to be able to cope with all possible combinations of loads and airspeeds. And that covers the first limiting factors. Now let's have a look at aeroelastic effects. Aeroelasticity is a complex phenomenon. It deals with the interaction between the aerodynamics and structural deformation. In simple terms, if an aerodynamic loads on a wing, it will deform. Consequently, the wing will have a different orientation with respect to the airflow. Now this different orientation changes the air load. Now let's have a look at a video that demonstrates aeroelasticity. What you see here is a flight test conducted by NASA in which they take a general aviation aircraft flying at high speeds where aeroelastic effects play a role, specifically on the tailplane of this aircraft. And as you can see, the forces, the structural deformations and the aerodynamic forces highly interact here and you can see that this could be quite dangerous. It is beyond the scope of this introduction lecture to, to explain this in detail. However, you should know that this phenomenon can become unstable at high airspeeds and this is called flutter. A very dangerous situation. The speed at which flutter occurs must be at least 15% above the design dive speed. 
we can indicate this with a hard boundary in the maneuver envelope. Now I have covered the maneuver envelope and the additional flutter limit. Maneuvers are performed intentionally by the pilot. However, there are also loads that the aircraft may encounter unintentionally as a result of the weather situation. Now these are called gust loads and I will treat them in the next video.